Alrighty, so let's take a look at the wonderful world of buffers, and you can see there that they are solutions that resist changes in pH even when we add acid or base to them. And a limited amount, we can't add an infinite amount of acid base, and we'll see that here as we go. But if you look, if I took 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid and added it to water, the pH would plummet from 7 down to 2. But if I add that same solution of hydrochloric acid to a buffered solution, the pH would only change about 0.1. And so this is a very key um, aspect of buffers, especially as you see here in several important biological fluids like our blood. Life kind of depends on this, and so that's why studying of buffers is important. And we can also see them commercially in different foods and medicines, etc. And we'll talk about that as we go here today and else to elsewhere in class, sorry. <laughs> so what do buffers contain? Buffers contain a weak acid and its conjugate base, or a weak base and its conjugate acid. So that's obviously why we're studying this here now during our acid and base equilibria section. Typically, these tend to be in equimolar amounts, or very, very close to each other as far as molarity is concerned. All right. So in other words, an acid and a base will be in equilibrium with, with each other and have the ability to ex work with hydronium and hydroxide. And we'll look at this here on a generic level. So if I have an equilibrium of a weak acid, and it's represented HA, and it's conjugate base. If I add strong acid to this equilibrium, that strong acid is going to contribute hydronium. And so the hydronium will interact with the conjugate base, produce some more of the weak acid, and water. So even though I'm adding strong acid, the buffer will absorb those hydroniums and turn it into water and a weak acid. So you can see that the pH will be held in check. Bases, on the other hand, would react with the hydroxide of the base would react with the weak acid. And so you would produce water and the conjugate base ion. Okay, so again, you could see how the pH change would be held in check because the hydroniums and hydroxides will be absorbed. Obviously, this will only happen as long as we have these species present. If we have those species present, then we're going to be able to continue to buffer. If we do not have, sorry, there they go, those species present, then the buffer will fail. But we'll see that. So our most important characteristics of a buffer, one, their pH, because we want them to work at a certain pH, like the pH of our blood should be somewhere around 7.2 to 7.4. So we don't want buffer systems in our body to have pHs way outside of that range, or they wouldn't work for what we need them to. And then, as I've been mentioning, the capacity, how much acid or base can react before the pH will change dramatically. And you can see that here in this little graph. Here I have one mole of acetic acid and one mole of sodium acetate. So I've got acetic acid, my weak acid, and its conjugate base. Again, sodium is a strong ion, so that's not involved. So we're pretty much just talking about the acetate ion as far as the buffer is concerned. And you can see in that shaded area of the graph, this buffer system is around a pH of 4.76. And you can see as, as I'm adding acid or adding base, the pH will only change slightly until you get to a point in time where the buffer capacity is exceeded and the pH will either rise sharply or plummet dramatically. And so you can see for this up to about one half the amounts of acid or conjugate base in solution. So again, after about a half a mole of acid or base is added, that's where we see this buffer cap capacity breaking down. All right, so buffers finding their pH. We've already done this. We did an example problem of this earlier, formic acid and the formate ion, and we were able to find x and calculate the pH because of the hydronium. With buffers, though, you typically aren't just handed the molarities. You're given a recipe, so like this. A buffer is made with 60 milliliters of 0.1 molar ammonia and 40 milliliters of 0.1 molar ammonium chloride. All right, what is its pH? 
Well, we need to find the concentrations. We're going to play mixy mixy with the 60 and 40 milliliters, so we're going to make 100 milliliters total. So what we have to adjust is and the concentration of each of these parts of the buffer system. So since we're experts at molarity and everything else, my 0.1 molar 60 mils of ammonia, there is 0 0.006 moles of ammonia in that 60 mils solution. But when I mix it together and put it into the total of 100 milliliters, it's a 0 0.06 molar solution of ammonia. And I can do the same with the ammonium chloride, of course, only really focusing on the ammonium, but I find out that I have a 0.04 molar ammonium chloride solution. So now this becomes just like one of our common ion equilibrium problems. Okay, so I have my 0.06 molar ammonia, my 0.04 molar ammonium chloride, and I know Kb for ammonia. So first I need to write my nice reaction. Ammonia plus water making ammonium and hydroxide. It's going to be a Kb expression, so right away I should be thinking my pH should be over 7. All right, so I need to fill out my ice table, pause the video, fill it out if you can. Remember we have two starting concentrations. Hopefully this is what your ice table looks like. I can do the check, but again, since my K value is 10 to the negative fifth, I'm pretty sure that my molarity divided by the K value will be greater than 100. So I can not worry about the quadratic. I can ignore my change in X's, and now I can do a fun plug and chug. KB is 0.04X divided by 0.06, solving for X. 2.7 times 10 to the negative fifth. Be careful, remember that is my concentration of hydroxide. And since that is my concentration of hydroxide, oops, sorry, then when I take the negative log of that, I will get pOH, which then means I have to subtract from 14 to find pH. All right, so it's a um, common ion effect equilibrium, two starting concentrations. The only thing we had to do different is we had to actually calculate the starting concentrations from the buffer recipe. Now, there is another way to do this, and it's called using the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. Now, even though the AP exam has taken the Henderson-Hasselbach equation off of the equations page. If you needed to do some kind of buffer calculation and you chose to use the Henderson-Hasselbach, it is totally accepted that you could do that. All right, this is what it looks like. The pH of my buffer solution is equal to the pKa plus the log of my conjugate base concentration divided by my conjugate acid concentration. If need be, you could also look at this equation as pOH equals pKb plus my log of the concentration of conjugate acid over the concentration of base and perhaps that's a way you would prefer to use it although it is typically um, given as this first equation and that's the one that I tend to use but if we have very similar equimolar situations of my conjugate acid and base, then that term pretty much drops off because the log of 1 is 0. And so essentially, if you have a buffer solution that needs to be created and you know the pH that you desire, you find a conjugate acid base pair that has a pKa close to pH and mix them together. All right? and then you can slightly adjust the pH by adding small amounts of the acid or bases as needed and this is the lab that we're going to be doing all right pKa by the way okay how do we find pH it's the negative log of hydronium how do you find pKa it's simply the negative log of Ka and we'll see that here with a calculation 
First, though, that, like I said, this is kind of what we're going to be doing in lab. I want to make a buffer solution. Which acid is going to make a good buffer solution with a pH of 4.9? All right. So here are the Ka's of some different acids. And I think you can look and immediately eliminate carbonic and boric because just knowing if we take the negative log of this, we're going to get an answer somewhere in the 7 and 10 range. But these two, benzoic and acetic, both have 10 to the negative fifth, so those are possibilities. If I take the negative log of those Ka's and get pKa's, I see that my acetic acid uh, it has a pKa very close to 4.9. So I would probably choose acetic acid. What would I partner up with it? I need the acetate ion preferably partnered up with one of my strongs, lithium, sodium, potassium, calcium, strontium, barium. So for example, I could choose to make, use acetic acid and sodium acetate equal in the equimolar situation. And when I do that, I would end up with a buffer solution with a pH around 4.8. So then I would just simply add a little more sodium acetate to get that pH to bump up close to 4.9. And so again, this is the problem we just did, where I had to take my buffer recipe and find my starting concentrations. And that was my Kb of ammonia. And we did perfectly fine by doing an ice table, but you could use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. All right, first thing, I notice I have a Kb of ammonia, but I need a Ka. So I will switch that by using Kw. And so that way I can find that my Ka for my ammonium ion is 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. Then I can do the negative log of that to find the pKa, which will be 9.25. And now I can plug and chug into the equation. 0.06 is the concentration of my conjugate base, and 0.04 is the concentration of the acid. Okay. Ammonium, NH4+, plus, is going to donate a hydrogen, which makes it the acid. Ammonia, NH3, can accept that hydrogen, which makes it the base. And you'll see there, through magic, that we end up with the exact same answer that we saw a couple slides earlier, of 9.43. All right, so again, you can use that equation anytime you see fit. It's just not in our equation packet and not something that they're going to supply you with. But if you know it, and want to use it, that's fantastic. All right, hope this helps. See you soon.